Okay, this is uh, the session on uh, the, uh, the 70th anniversary of the road to serfdom. And uh, I thought that uh, we of all people should have something to say about it. Uh, uh, the, arguably the most famous book in Austrian economics in the 20th century. And, uh, and so uh, I don't know if everyone knows that uh, when uh, our friend uh, Yuri over here, Yuri Maltsev and Tom Woods were on the Glenn Beck television show a couple of years ago talking about the road to serfdom. The next day, the road to serfdom went to number one in sales on Amazon.com, which is pretty remarkable. And uh, I had mixed feelings about that because uh, when my book, The, the, the Real Lincoln, came out, I was on uh, the Rush Limbaugh show uh, after that. Walter Williams guest hosted it, and I, my book went to number two in sales on Amazon, but it never made it to number one. I stood in front, I sat in front of that computer for about 36 hours waiting for the two to turn to a one. And because I had, I already had the printout. I had the printout of Amazon with my book number two in sales, but uh, never happened. So, so anyway, so, so I guess I can get my revenge if I say bad things about the road to serfdom. So, uh, so I'm just going to make a few comments. I asked the speakers to say something about um, uh, the uh, applicability or relevance of the road to serfdom today, even if you think it's not relevant today. David Gordon might take that. Uh, take that tech. I don't know. And so, uh, so that's that's what I plan to do. Uh, nothing too uh, heavy duty, but uh, so I wrote down some some notes about uh, things that I think uh, are should be especially useful in in teaching and in, in teaching students or anybody uh, about uh, some of the lessons of the road to serfdom. And uh, and we each have about seventeen minutes. And so, uh, you know, so I wrote down a few of my my favorite quotes from the road to serfdom. In chapter three, the chapter on individualism and collectivism, uh, Hayek wrote this, the economic planning, which is the prime instrument of socialist reform, can be used for many other purposes. We must centrally direct economic activity if we want to make the distribution of income conform to current ideas of social justice, for example. Planning, therefore, is wanted by all those who demand that production for use be substituted for production for profit. So in other words, environmentalism, well of welfare states, socialized health care, the public schools, the government roads, it's all socialism. And, and, and so the lessons of uh, the critiques of socialism really should apply to all of that because it really is, uh, you know, the argument for government intervention in all these areas really is uh, uh, production for use, not for profit, which is, you know, uh, of course, is probably the dumbest idea ever to, uh, to come along. It seems to be the mantra of the current pope, though, however. He's, he, he keeps repeating the idea that uh, successful business people are only in it for themselves, that somehow you can make money by only benefiting yourself and not benefiting your customers. Uh, but that's, that's what he says, and that's, and that's wrong. Um, chapter 4 is called The Inevitability of Planning. And, and here's where uh, uh, Hayek in the road to serfdom comes back over and over again to his knowledge problem, even before it was known as the knowledge problem. And he says this, the more complicated the whole in terms of society, the whole society, the more dependent we become on that division of knowledge between individuals whose separate efforts are coordinated by the impersonal mechanism for transmitting the relevant information known by us as the price system. So the more complex the the more complicated society becomes, the more globalization there is, uh, the more important it is to rely on the market. Uh, and, and that's a theme all throughout Hayek's writing, uh, not just the road to, to serfdom. And that's, that's, that was always uh, one of the key uh, arguments that was made in debates over socialism before the worldwide collapse of socialism in the late 80s, early 90s. On uh, the chapter on planning and democracy, chapter 5, Hayek said this, it would be impossible for any mind, this is the knowledge problem again, to comprehend the infinite variety of different needs of different people which compete for the available resources and to attach a definite weight to each. Even if a man takes a warm interest in the welfare of every human being he knows, the ends about which he can be concerned with will always only be an infinitesimal fraction of the needs of all men, and that's sort of classic Hayekian statement that uh, no human mind could possibly comprehend the needs of all the people. Therefore, uh, the whole the phrases like the general interest, the public interest, are just are meaningless. Social justice, meaningless because no. Uh, even if you are well-meaning, he said, even if you're an angel, 
it's impossible to process all that information. No, no human being or group of human beings possibly could uh, could do it. And that's uh, you know, another sort of really a restatement of his uh, knowledge problem. And then he goes on the same chapter. He says this. Planning leads to dictatorship because dictatorship is the most effective instrument of coercion and the enforcement of ideals and, as such, essential if central planning on a large scale is to be possible. That's why I put this handout around the room that because in in the same chapter he talks about how whenever governments engage in interventionism and one interventionism sort of interventionism fails, they resort to a different kind of intervention to rescue themselves. That fails, and it goes on and on. And so they can't, but they will never admit failure. No matter how much they screw up the health care system, for example, they're never going to admit that socialized health care is a bad idea. And so uh, what they have to do is to, to crush all kinds of dissent to, uh, on the part of people who have realized that, hey, this is not working. And so then they turn to a dictator of some kind. And uh, when I reread that, it reminded me of all the czars that we have in America today. So I went online and did a little search uh, in the, the source of all human knowledge, Wikipedia. And, uh, <laughs> and it did have a list, a list of these are actual government jobs of people who are given jobs as czars, which means they're unaccountable, you know, even more unaccountable to voters than anybody else. You know, of course, not even Congress is accountable to voters because they've gerrymandered all themselves in. And so they can pretty much they can pretty much do whatever they want. But these guys, they can really do whatever they want. I mean, no one even no one knows any of them. Did you know we had an Asian carp czar in the United States, for example? And so, and so anyway, that that is what popped into my mind when I read reread um, Hayek's statement about turning to some sort of economic dictator. And these are all areas in which the government has attempted to impose economic dictatorship of some kind that is totally. You know, it issues regulations and orders that are even even more detached from public scrutiny than uh, government normally is. Now, on the chapter uh, who and whom, this is something I always make it a point to uh, tell my students, whether we're talking about the road to serfdom or not. He says this, the power which a multiple millionaire, in Hayek's days there were only multiple multiple millionaires, there weren't billionaires, I guess. And the power which a multiple millionaire who may be my neighbor and perhaps my employer has over me is very much less than that which the smallest functionaire possesses who wields the coercive power of the state and on whose discretion it depends whether and how I am to be allowed to live or to work. And uh, the way I tell it to my students is usually the lowliest bureaucrat at the Department of Motor Vehicles has a more of a negative effect on your life than the richest man in the world, Bill Gates, ever could. All Bill Gates can do is try to persuade you to buy his products. And you can always tell Bill Gates, go play in the traffic, Bill Gates. I'm, I'm using, I'm an Apple computer user. You can't say that to the DMV bureaucrat. They'll call the state cop that's lurking in the background to, to do something, maybe taser you or take you out back and beat you up or something. You know, the, that's, you know, police nowadays they seem to be doing a lot of that. But it is true, the lowliest bureaucrat in local government has a bigger effect on your life than the richest people in the world do as far as, as, far as coercion goes. And then he, uh, he says this, he says, as the coercive power, this is another one of my favorites from Hayek, as the coercive power of the state will alone decide, under socialism or planning, he says, will alone decide who is to have what, the only power worth having will be a share in the exercise of this directing power. So under a, a planned society or some version of socialism, the only power worth having is political power. And this, this was long before the phrase rent-seeking was invented. Uh, you know, I think in the 1970s, that phraseology came into the economics uh, lexicon. But, uh, but this is basically what he was talking about, I think, here, that uh, once, uh, because it is a very old idea, the idea of rent-seeking. So once, once uh, a society becomes sufficiently politicized, the only power worth having will be political power. And the opportunity cost of that is that people will invest less in becoming producers and will invest more in becoming political manipulators. Fewer students will go to engineering and business school, more will go to law school in the, or the Kennedy School of Government, as they call it, places like that, to become rent-seekers. 
Uh, on the chapter, you know, most people who have read the uh, Road to Serfdom, their favorite chapter seems to be uh, chapter 10, Why the Worst Get on Top. Uh, why the, why under a planned, government planned society, the worst human beings tend to rise up to the top. Uh, my old friend Jim Bennett, uh, years ago, maybe 25 years ago, told me that he, he called this his septic tank theory of government. He said, in government, the big chunks always rise to the top. <laughs> and, and, and that's, that's a, <laughs> that was in the course of a context of us talking about the road to serfdom at the time, and this chapter on the road to serfdom. But uh, and one of the one of the things that Hayek says here is the totalitarian dictator would soon have to choose between uh, disregard of ordinary morals and and failure. It is for this reason that the unscrupulous and uninhibited are likely to be more successful in a society tending toward totalitarianism. So again, you, you don't have to be talking about Hitler's Germany or Stalin's Russia. To uh, to uh, you know, tending toward totalitarianism is what he what he said here, and and it certainly does seem true, doesn't it, doesn't it? That the people you see in government are the people with the the least, the, at least at the top, are the people with the least qualms about uh, brutalizing or plundering their their fellow citizens. In the chapter on the end of truth, chapter eleven, all of this sounds so familiar to someone like myself who's been uh, in academe uh, so long. Myths are essential to creating a government plan society. Uh, the Lincoln myth, for example. Uh, uh, yeah, since I mentioned that, my old friend Clyde Wilson, uh, one of my favorite uh, Clyde quotes. Uh, he, he's one of the, you know, of all the years I've been in academe, Clyde is one of the wisest old men that I've met in, in academe. And I've known Nobel Prize winners and I've known David Gordon for a long time. But, uh, but one of Clyde's things, things that he said, the image of America has changed. It, it once was George Washington on a white horse and it has become a corporate lobbyist in an armchair. And he speaks about the Lincoln Memorial, yes, yeah, so or the image of America. So, 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 so myths are essential. Hayek said critics must be silenced. Uh, is Walter Block here? I think Walter is ill. He's not here. Uh, intolerance is encouraged, and of course that reminds me of hate speech laws. Intolerance is encouraged, and. Uh, and uh, of course, one of the things I've been observing on the college campuses, and many of you have too, in the past. 20, 25 years is uh, st many students have been taught now that uh, they're, they're not taught the reasons for free speech. They're not taught the case for free speech, uh, but they all are taught why it is that it's legitimate to crack down on free speech. For example, one theory that is very popular among the so-called cultural Marxists who now dominate the Amer American university systems is that uh, speech is a tool in which the oppressors used to oppress uh, the, the oppressed classes, so that it is actually meritorious to censor and, 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 and uh, character assassinate the oppressors, which are basically, as far as I can tell, white heterosexual males, uh, and, and, and the oppressed is everybody else. And so when you see these, these things on college campuses of a, a conservative speaker shows up and they, they scream and yell and they have to call the police and they cancel the lecture or they, or they, uh, they, uh, maliciously libel a good man like Walter Block uh, or something like that, they think they're doing the right thing, the meritorious thing, because the ends justify the means. Uh, and students have been taught that. And I, I've talked to quite a few of them in, over the years and they, and they've been, they've been indoctrinated in this idea. Yeah, there. In the same chapter, uh, and this sounds, should sound familiar too, uh, Hayek wrote this. You know, he said, the whole apparatus for spreading knowledge, he's talking about a totalitarian society. And ask yourself if this fits your society. He said, the schools and the press, radio and motion picture will be used exclusively to spread those views which, whether true or false, will strengthen the belief in the rightness of the decisions taken by the authority. And all information that might cause doubt or hesitation will be withheld. There is no field where the systematic control of information will not be practiced and uniformity of views not enforced. Uh, well, I think everybody could recognize a lot of that happening. Although at the same time, we've got the Internet on our side and we've got the Mises Institute uh, which is why so many people hate us uh, so much. Uh, and so one thing everybody should understand is that if you're hated by the right people, you know you're doing the right thing. 
And so every time I, I have, I run into somebody that says, well, oh boy, that uh, John Stewart or somebody really, that really doesn't like what you're doing, does he? Well, well, that's good. I'd be really be worried if they said, oh, the New York Times loves you. So, so when we were attacked by the New York Times, that's, you know, you know, big, uh, big gold star for us. Yeah, if, <laughs> if you're doing that. And, uh, Finally, the final comment I would make is that the chapter 13, uh, Hayek, this is a very quaint, it's called the totalitarians in our midst. And you read this and you get the impression that Hayek was, you know, right, sitting there writing this thinking, well, I need to warn people that there are, you know, this is England, you know, he's writing this in, in Cambridge, England and thinking, well, we, you know, the totalitarians, totalitarians aren't all in Nazi Germany and Stalin's Russia. We got some right here. And, and so apparently in his day, he had to, inform people that there were totalitarians in our midst. But of course, in American society today, they're everywhere. That's you, I mean, you trip over them. You just go, go to any college campus, and, and, and as far as that goes. Yeah, listen to the news media at night. And so, you know, they're everywhere, polluted with totalitarian-minded people uh, all around. So, that, so, uh, so this is a, a, a good warning, I guess, totalitarians in our midst. midst. And it's not, it's not anything too exotic. Uh, they seem to be uh, pretty much everywhere. Uh, in our day, also, and uh, maybe my time is almost is about up. I'll end with one, maybe one little story. I might have told this some other year at this course, but I, I met Hayek years ago. I have a picture of me and Hayek in my, my office, and and uh, and he told a story. He was at a Mont Pelerin Society meeting at, uh, in Cambridge, England, where he wrote the Road to Serfdom, and he claims to have written it while sitting on the roof of uh, of a building at Cambridge, where he and Keynes took turns uh, watching out for the German Luftwaffe. Uh, to bombing Cambridge, and, uh, and and so anyway, he told this story that he said that uh, there's a man. I understand there's a man here tonight. This is a room with 700 people in it at Cambridge University. He said, I understand there's a man here tonight who really should have been the co-author to the Road to Serfdom, and I have not seen him since 1945. And I understand he's here. Where is he? And this 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 old uh, white-haired old gentleman stands up with his cane and. And, and the women were crying and some of the men were crying. And, you know, these, these were all Hayek fans, Mont Pelerin Society. And, uh, and, you know, huge applause. And the two old men, you know, got you know, embraced and, they, you know, they hadn't seen each other in all those years. The next day, Jim Bennett, my septic tank theory of government friend, we're at a, a pub, pub and the old man is there, the old, the old gray-haired old man. And we walked up to him and we said, well, that's quite a story. You should be the co-author of The Road to Serfdom. And he said, I don't know what Hayek is talking about. I see him all the time. And we just had, we just went to the theater last month with, the, with well, Hayek. So, <laughs> so, so, so he, he made the whole thing up, in other words. He made the whole thing up. He made the whole thing up. And, and when he gave a talk at George Mason when I was there, the first thing he said is, I'm the only human being that I know of who has recovered from senility, and I think quitting smoking did it. It returned oxygen to my brain. So that's one of the things I remember personally about Hayek.